when you look at the situation right now in Gaza, we've seen reports coming from the doctors who came from Gaza. They have been witnessing some unbelievable pictures in Gaza. I'm going to play a clip that these doctors are talking about what they have been witnessing. And I spent two weeks at Al-Aqsa Hospital, um, and I think it's fair to say I wasn't remotely prepared for what I, was, what I saw. I saw um, the most appalling atrocities, uh, and I saw things that I never would have expected to have seen in any healthcare setting. I saw things at Al-Aqsa Hospital which I still wake up at night thinking about uh, appalling injuries in particularly women and children, uh, the, the, the most devastating burns in small children. One child that I'll never forget had burns so bad you could see her facial bones. We knew there was no chance of her surviving that, but there was no morphine to give her. So not only was she inevitably going to die, but she would die in agony. And what made it even worse, that there was nowhere for her to go and die. So she was just left on the floor of the emergency department to die. And that's just one story. We've all seen multiple stories like that. This is Hiyam Abu Khadr. She's seven years old. Um, she is uh, one of the victims of the war in Gaza. Um, a bomb hit her family home. So her father and brother were killed and her mother also was injured and she had burned and she sustained uh, third degree burns on 40 percent of her body she was treated by one of our volunteers uh, dr vanita gupta who is critical care specialist from new york in the european hospital uh, in Deir al balah and dr gupta uh, took some videos of her and you can see her face in the videos and also in this picture and you if you want to define uh, post-traumatic stress disorder this is what post-traumatic stress disorder looked like in the face of a child who's seven years old. She was supposed to be evacuated to Egypt, and she waited for weeks before she was eventually evacuated, and she died two days after evacuation because, because it was too late. So what does that mean for injured people? They arrive, they get a quick and dirty surgery in an, in an emergency room or in an operating theater, and they have nowhere to be hospitalized afterward or when they are they are lost all throughout the hospital and our teams spend all day searching for the hospital the patient that they just operated on 12 hours before what does this mean over the long run the the longer this war goes on the the longer these wounds have to rot and I mean really rot the infections are getting worse and worse and it's horrific it's horrific for our providers and it's absolutely horrific for these patients um, it's hard to to watch uh to watch that, Nima, uh, and I noticed that it's an uh, Al Almadeen that is sh showing it, not CBS or CNN, but it's real. It's what's going on. We talked last week about starvation. That's on setting right now. People are already starving there in Gaza. Um, how about the burns? You know, um, during World War II, uh, people were gassed, right? Some were incinerated with the, the, the bombing that happened in Dresden and elsewhere, but, but many of the Jews were gassed. And after the war, uh, Thomas Merton, uh, he wrote something very brief, which talked about a, uh, well, let me not, uh, let me not mislead people here. It's a poem that was entitled Chant. So a chant, a singing chant by the commandant of a Nazi death camp. Subtitle, chant to be used in processions around a site with furnaces. You know what the allusion to furnaces means. Now, in Merton's chant, um, the commandant of this site, this guest site, 
proceeds matter-of-factly through his normal daily duties, his daily routine of genocide, and he proceeds until these two concluding lines, okay? Here are the lines. Uh, this is Merton talking now. Do not think yourselves better because you burn up friends and enemies with long-range missiles without ever seeing what you have done. That was a warning way back uh, before Vietnam and then during Vietnam, we saw victims burnt. We saw, well, how many people have to die to call it genocide? McNamara, Secretary of Defense McNamara himself cites the figure of three million Vietnamese dead, many of them burnt. Um, so here we see these children uh, in Gaza attacked in the same way in what the UN has all but called, well, has called a plausible situation of genocide. And so the question is, um, the question is for us uh, who can talk about this or can cite it in an interview like this, what will we do about it? And the odds are all so, so set up against us that we tend to just say, oh, it's too terrible to watch. Thank God I don't have to watch Al Almadine. I could watch just CNN and get a totally different story. Uh, is that where we are as Americans? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, there is, a, I, I think, a typically American trait, although it, it's, it's available elsewhere, of course, it's the fear of uh, trying something and not succeeding. In other words, the fear of embarking on something uh, and your friends saying, oh, that's ridiculous. Uh, that's not going to work. And you do it anyway. And the results are what not, what, not what you hoped for. Uh, many people have talked about this. Camus. Uh, the French uh, philosopher addressed this in the wake of uh, of World War II. And I drug out a, a little uh, uh, segment from him. Uh, he was uh, particularly disappointed, I would say even angry, at the lack of any moral authority, including uh, the moral authority of the church, whether it be Catholic or Lutheran in those days in Germany, or whether it be in Rome. Um, he wrote this very briefly. We have the crises of planet, poverty, and peace. But the fourth crisis is religion. Our religious communities are remaining on the sidelines. As Thomas Merton said, my, my comment, they're guilty bystanders. Camus again, I think much religion has been selling people on an evacuation plan, selling people on an evacuation plan rather than helping them participate in a transformation plan. Back to Camus. We have nothing to lose except everything. So let's go ahead. This is the wager of our generation. If we are to fail, it is better in any case to have stood on the side of those who choose life rather than those on the side who are destroying life. So, you know, this is, this is not new. This goes back as far as I do. And that's, you know, that's 85 years. So what are we, what are we to do? Um, I think we need to heed the, the moral guides that did speak out, um, that warned about uh, staying on the sidelines, being bystanders was not a moral choice. It was an immoral choice. Here's Merton, Thomas Merton, just a couple of sentences. It has to do with results and success. Uh, many of us Americans, uh, you know, fear being left at 
yeah, doing something and pretty, pretty imposing and pretty, pretty, what, courageous about being left at when we're put in jail for overnight or something like that. Merton, Thomas Merton, don't depend on the hope of results. When you're doing the sort of work that you have taken on, that we have taken on, you may have to face the fact that your work will achieve no result at all, or even results contrary to what you want. As you get used to this idea, you start more and more to concentrate not on the not on the results, but on the value of the work itself, on the value of its rightness and its truth. I'll just close with one of my favorite passages in Father Dan Berrigan's autobiography, where he talks about the first bold action they took in burning draft cards in front of that little town outside Baltimore called Catonsville. Uh, they were inside the post office, which was the only federal building in Cadenceville. And uh, in his in his uh, autobiography, Dan Bergen notes, uh, remember, he's a poet, you know, he's, he, he writes, uh, here we stood, here we all sat around, all nine of us around this post office. And uh, I began to think, my God, I'm going to be called a commie. I'm going to be called stupid. I'm going to be foolish. They're going to say, put him in jail forever, for God's sake. He doesn't know what he's doing. So was what we did just now worth it? In view of the fact that those are the results. And he said, you know, I came for a long time to contemplate that. And and I finally decided, oh, yeah, right. It is worth it. Um, Now, results are not, I repeat this. Results are not unimportant, but they are secondary. Secondary to the goodness of the act. We do something because it's good. We do something not because we know it will succeed or even that it has a good percentage of succeeding. We do something because it's good. Now, that gives me and gave Dan Melsberg, who was a jailmate with Dan Berrigan many times after demonstrations, uh, a lot of a lot of inspiration to do the right thing no matter what. I'll tell you one more little lesson yet about Dan Berrigan. I saw him. He's a Jesuit priest. Uh, he was in the infirmary at Fordham University, my alma mater. I saw him just a couple months before before he died. He was very frail, and uh, we there were three of us went in there and into his bedroom, and I was a little worried. Well, you know, would he be compass mentis? You know, and and sure enough, there were about six books on his bed table, all of them with little pieces of paper and markers. And I thought, oh, he's probably, he's probably still with it. So uh, I said, Father Dan, yeah, I, a couple of my friends and I are going over to Moscow next week uh, to give an award for integrity, uh, for speaking truth to Ed Snowden. I didn't know if if uh, Berrigan would know Ed Snowden. He's oh, good, says uh, Berrigan. He's got a sort of a raspy voice. Good. So I said, would you have any words for, for Ed that I could pass along to him? He, he knows of you. And he says, yeah, yeah. Tell him. Tell him he did the right thing. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Then I said, Dan Ellsberg, whom you know very well, having spent several evenings and more in jail with him, I talked with him last week. I told him I might be seeing you here at Fordham. Do you have any words for Dan Ellsberg? I'll get back to him. And uh, Berrigan had this little smile on his face. He said, yeah. Tell him. Tell him he did the right thing, too. (laughs) No, <laughs> that sounded kind of poignant, kind of nice, sort of cute and all. But I reflected on that, you know, and what Berrigan is just telling us, look, don't worry about the rest of it. Don't worry about results, although they are not unimportant. They are secondary to doing the right thing. And so 
That's why I'm so delighted to be at a program like yours, Nima. We try to get at the truth and what better way to do the right thing than to put out the truth, to name genocide for what it is, to be able to look at those photos that you just showed and say, my God, what have we become? And finally, can we afford to be innocent bystanders? I don't think so. I think those of us who want to remain human have to find some way to challenge that now, because in the final analysis, this genocide would not be happening without the support of our government. And if we pretend to be a democracy, we have to act as the people and change this terrible government support for genocide. Uh, those pictures elicit those remarks from me. Uh, others say things much more eloquently, but but I feel it in my heart. And I think we have to start moving from our heart, uh, from our minds, and not just talk about things, but do whatever we can in our own circumstances to do it.